Hello, everyone, and welcome to the iSpring Solutions webinar series, where every week we talk about e-learning trends, share iSpring tips and tricks, and talk about clients' cases. My name is Paulina. I'm the community manager at iSpring, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar, where we will be actually discussing moving to the virtual classroom. And to cover this topic, I have invited virtual training consultant, facilitator, author, and a speaker, Cindy Huggett. Hi, Cindy. Thanks a lot for being our guest speaker today. How are you doing? I'm doing so well, and what a timely topic. This is a perfect one for us to look at here in 2020. I'm glad to be here, Polina. Awesome. I'm going to pull up some slides. While I'm doing that, I'd love to know who's here. I'm joining you today from Raleigh, North Carolina, but I'd like to know where you're joining in from. I see we've got Pennsylvania, West Virginia, St. Louis, Columbia, South Carolina. I'm seeing Canada, places in Europe, London, Mexico, India. Lovely, South Africa. One of the greatest benefits of the virtual classroom is our ability to connect and to connect in a way that we don't need to leave our homes or leave our desks. We've got Pakistan, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my hometown. I'm joining you today though from Raleigh, North Carolina, and it is a, uh, very hot summer day here in North Carolina. So welcome everybody. And as you know from the description, we're going to take a look at a roadmap to moving to the virtual classroom. Most of us have been forced to come into the virtual classroom, whether you were doing it before or brand new because of the global situation that we find us in here in 2020. But the big question, regardless of where you are in virtual training, that we're going to answer today. How do you move from the in-person classroom to the virtual classroom? That's the big question and the seven steps to move online. In fact, I have a handout for you that has these seven steps. And Paulina, can we pop that into the chat box for everyone? It'll also be available in the follow-up email message where if you'd like a takeaway with all seven of these steps, you'll find them. So I've told you that I'm joining today from Raleigh, North Carolina. I have found out where your joining from today as you've been typing that in chat and as I think through the different things that I have done and what brought me here about 20 years ago almost 20 years ago I was working inside an organization and I was told to cut my budget stop traveling and still deliver training to my global audience and so that's what I started to do this is one of the earliest screenshots that I have back from 2003 one one of my leadership programs with a global audience. And I started delivering online classes and I kept getting asked, Cindy, how did you learn? How did you learn how to facilitate, design, interact with a global audience? And so that turned into my consulting business. So that's what I do and have done for about the last 15, 16 years, helped organizations and training professionals move online. Now, the question that I've been asked, how have I learned, I'd like to know from all of you, and you can put in the questions box. I'm watching it. I can see things come in. We're going to use that to communicate today. What's something that you have learned lately, and how did you learn it? So as I'm seeing some responses come in, David said he's learned video editing through online tutorials. Uh, Marcelo, you're learning to be patient. I think that's what many of us would say, the necessity of learning how to be patient. Oh, Angel is learning how to make enchiladas, uh, champagne vinaigrette salad dressing. 
some of you are learning classroom lessons. Well, most of you, as you're thinking about how you've learned how to do something, back uh, 20, 30, 50 years ago, we would have said, how did I learn it? I learned it by asking somebody. I learned it by going to an encyclopedia. And today, we learn mostly online. And the overwhelming move to technology, the fact that we are accessing learning online, I think is fascinating. And so to set the stage for our conversation, how we are moving to the virtual classroom, let's take a look at some fascinating facts. And something that has been around for a while, a screen that uh, a picture a photo that some of you have seen back in 2005 when we would get together we would listen to a speaker fast forward to 2013 seven years ago my how the uh, scenario has changed with our devices and now even today, we're meeting using technology uh, like go to webinar that we're in today and so Back in 2005, across all industries, 70% of all formal training hours were done in the in-person classroom. What do you think that number was last year? You can tell me in the questions box. I'd love to get some votes. This comes from the ATD State of the Industry report, by the way. So I'm seeing votes, traditional in-person classroom. I'm seeing everything from 10% all the way up to 90 percent so it was 70 percent in 2005 15 years ago 50 percent 40 percent well according to the atd state of the industry report it was 54 percent just over halfway so what that tells me is that the traditional training classroom isn't going away. Now, of course, this was pre-pandemic, and we know that that number, when we look at the data for next year, it's certainly going to change. What about the live online classroom? Last year, in 2019, according to that report, what percent of all formal training hours were facilitated in the live online classroom? Wow, I'm seeing some really high numbers, 40, 50, 25. Well, it was actually just 11%. Now, it's not to say we didn't have virtual meetings and it's not to say that we didn't use it, but it was quite a small percentage. So in 2016, ATD did a report on virtual classrooms, and in that report, 86% of organizations said, we're getting ready to move to the virtual classroom. We're, we have plans to do it. In 2019, the very beginning of the year toward maturity put out a report 93 percent of organizations said yep we're going to use the live online classroom i have been doing a, a research study a survey over the past few months and no surprise most organizations have increased. Uh, this is a screenshot of my 2019 survey, but um, more than 90% of people say they're moving. So we know it, you know it, and I know it. We're moving towards the virtual classroom. And I get asked often, what's going to happen once we start meeting in person again? I don't think it's going away. So the big question as we think about moving to the virtual classroom, that question that we're answering today, how do we do it and do it well? Well, there are three components to a successful virtual class. It's gonna take an interactive design, it's going to take an engaging facilitator and participants who are prepared. When I look at these seven steps that we're walking through today, my focus is going to be on that facilitator role. What do facilitators, what do trainers, what do uh, those who are presenting 
painting content need to do to move? Now, we're not going to ignore the design and the participants, but as you're looking at these items, they do skew a little heavy towards the delivery side, which takes me to a poll question. So, Paulina, if we could get our first poll question ready, what's your experience with virtual facilitation. Are you still brand new or fairly new to it? Have you been doing it for a while? You should be seeing a poll question popping up on your screen. I can see a lot of responses coming in. We'll give you about 10 more seconds to register your vote. Thank you, everybody. We'll share with you the results in a moment. We've got just a, a nice, even uh, collection. Many of you, almost 40%, have quite a significant amount of experience, where uh, half of you, 24 plus 26%, have facilitated less than 10 events and 12% at none. So I want to talk to those of you who have done this in the, that 39% for just a moment. For those of you who are quite experienced in the virtual classroom, I'm going to put a trophy on screen. And some of you recognize this trophy. It is the Stanley Cup here in the uh, time frame we're in, August of 2020, the Stanley Cup playoffs are going. So whatever your favorite sport is, that championship trophy, when the team wins the trophy, not long after that, they go back to basic camp. They go back to the basics. And when we think about virtual facilitation, when you are the best at what you do, there's always a good opportunity to be reminded of the basics, just like the best athletes in the world. So I hope you'll see a few of the things we talk about today from a beginner's mind and check to see, am I applying those items? Not to say you're not going to leave here without some tips, um, but more than half of you, 60%, are fairly new. Now, when it comes to facilitation, some of you might be asking the question, well, what type of events are there? What things can I facilitate? And I think it's worth mentioning as we start to look at the seven-step process to moving online, that not all events are the same. There's different kinds of live online events. We have our meetings, and when we think about in-person meetings, now those are happening virtually, our video conference meetings. So we've got standard meetings, and then we have our video meetings. We have presentations. When we do that online, those are our webcasts, or in some cases, webinars. We have our training classes, and when we move training online, we've got, uh, obviously, we still call them training classes. And so why does it matter that we stop and say, let's think about what type of event you're going to have, because we want to set clear expectations for all. For one set of organizations, when they say we're going to the virtual classroom or we're moving online, that might mean an asynchronous set of e-learning programs that the learners will go through. But for other people, it's a live presentation with a presenter or a facilitator. So step number one in our seven steps is to clarify your definition what do you mean by virtual when we're moving to the virtual classroom? I've asked that question of thousands of people. What do you mean by virtual? And I've gotten about a thousand different answers. One time I worked with an organization and they said, we want to go to the virtual classroom. And I said, great, how can I help? And they said, well, we're going to put iPads in the classroom. And we're going to have our participants look Look at their documentation on that iPad. And I thought, great, that's your definition of virtual. That's not my definition of virtual. My definition of virtual, just for um, clarity, I'll put it on screen. And uh, when I think of a virtual class or virtual training, 
this is my definition. It's in the handout that I've shared. It's also showing up on your screen. Which words stand out to you in this definition? What's capturing your attention? Uh, most of you are pointing out Bernadette and Evelyn, Joanne, Michelle. You're pointing out the fact that I'm assuming it's interactive. A number of you, Muhammad and uh, Don and a few others are saying, you're noting that it's synchronous. I'm referring to the live online with a facilitator, the facilitator-led part. That I'm thinking of participants who are dispersed, which right now today in our current climate doesn't surprise anybody. But when we used to be in our offices together, I'm not thinking of a group of people huddled around a conference table. I'm thinking of one person, one device. And that we're using a platform that has tools similar to what we would find in an in-person class. That we have things like breakouts or being able to raise our hands or write on the whiteboard. So when we think about this definition, when I think about step number one, I'm trying to get really clear with my audience that this is what I mean when it comes to a training class. And I hope you will do the same, that you're thinking about your definition. And when we think about moving online, what's the same or what's different between a traditional class, and we'll focus in on learning as learning professionals, well, one of the key differences is that we're connecting through technology. And when we connect through technology and we think about this moving to uh, online, but we're connecting through screens, I asked when I was writing my my uh, first book, Virtual Training Basics, what's the number one piece of advice you would give somebody who's first starting out? And Mike Abrams said it best when he said, you know, one of the biggest failures of online trainers is just not knowing the tool, not knowing, not recognizing what buttons you push or how you manage something like a breakout. So that takes us to step two of our seven step process. Step number one was to clarify our definition. Step number two is to learn the technology. Now, you have, speaking of your technology, the ability to raise your hand. You should see a little raise hand button on your grab tab there. I'd love to know if you know how to juggle. And if you know how to juggle, click on the grab tab, the raise hand button, I'll see. Wow, Paulina, we've got a number of people here who know how to juggle. That's interesting. It's a little surprising. Usually I get just one or two hands. We've got a few hundred of you. Well, there's a lot of you that are not raising your hand. And so let's say today, four hours from now, we were going to have a juggling test. And all of you, every one of you was going to be asked to juggle and let's say juggle some balls in the air and yeah I mean the real juggling I don't mean juggling tasks or juggling children I mean uh, juggling balls in the air thank you for clarifying that uh, so if you were to have a test a juggling test what would you do in the next four hours to learn tell me in the questions box tell me what you would do Awesome, I'm seeing a number of things come in. Libby's going to practice and so is Dawn. Shannon is starting small. Several of you are going to go look up videos, right? We look for things online, how we learn new things. Lisa, what a great idea. Start with something soft like handkerchiefs. As you are sharing these items, this is how you will likely learn whatever platform, whatever technology that you're using. The same way, several of you are saying, I'm just gonna get in there and practice. And you want to practice every tool, every button. What does it look like from the organizer perspective, from the presenter perspective, from the attendee perspective? Show that we're comfortable with it and we can supply the content or the learning event without getting tripped up, without getting um, concerned about the technology, which takes us to step number three. 
and that's being prepared. Now, I know if you have facilitated, and let's raise our hands again, if you facilitate in-person classes, or you used to uh, have done that in the past, how many of you are classroom facilitators? Raise your hand if you are. Click on that grab tab, raise hand button. Thank you, everyone. Lots of us, yes, have that experience. Well. When we think about getting prepared, we're going to prepare like we do for a classroom program. But let's think, let's go to the next level. And some of the most prepared individuals that I can think of are the Olympic athletes. So how would an Olympic athlete who's getting ready for the games prepare for the games? What are some of the things that Olympic athletes do to get ready? So many great ideas popping up here. Going through a dry run, Michelle says. Practicing, thank you, Glenda. Looking, Nuria's adding for those best practices. Working with a coach, several of you would add in. Paul and Joe are adding in. Visualizing success, Robin adds in. Watching their diet, Lynn, I'm glad you brought in that part because this question that you're answering, yes, it's how Olympic athletes prepare, but truthfully, I'm asking you how you should prepare. And all of these items, whether it's the practice, whether it's the working with a coach to get some feedback, you're mental prep as well as your physical preparation, proper diet. Cindy, what does that have to do with preparing to facilitate virtually? Well, we need a good, strong voice. We need the energy to connect with a remote audience across the screen. And it's tough to do that if our health, if, our, if we're tired, if we have a headache, if we have a voice. It's that same idea, practicing, practicing, practicing. So virtual facilitators, when we talk about this step number three, are going to prepare just just like you do when you prepare for an in-person, but we're going to the next step to prepare our technology. I wanna share with you a peek at my desk when I'm getting ready to facilitate a live online event. I've already shared with you, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I work out of my home office. I have for the last 16 years. This is what my desk looks like when I'm getting ready to facilitate, what do you notice about it? Now, I work in a lot of different platforms, so it doesn't matter what platform, it's my same setup, it's my same type of setup. You can type in the question box, what is standing out to you? Most of you are nosing. Aurelia's noticed that it's well organized. Cheryl is pointing out that I've got the multiple screens, <laughs> my water. Oh, please notice that water has a lid on it. <laughs> I've learned that the hard way. I've got uh, several headsets. I've got several screens. I have a clock that's a little bit larger. Uh, it looks like a mint, Shannon. It's actually a USB drive so that if I needed to transfer files from one computer to another and my internet were to be down, I could do that. It's redundant, Mark says. And Cheryl was asking about my keyboard. It's just cut off in the picture. I've got an external keyboard that is right in front of me, just in the front part of the picture. So we're talking about Olympic athlete preparation. And one of the documents that I have, it's out on my website, cindyhuggett.com slash resources. One of those is a extra prepared virtual trainer checklist. Your preparation should include plan B. And not just plan B, but plan C and plan D and plan E and plan F. 
when we're facilitating in person, you bring an extra copy of the handout with you to your on-site. And if we're going to facilitate virtually, that preparation you go through. So important, everybody. Now, when we're continuing through our steps, we're up to step number four already. And step number four involves engaging our participants. You've gotten ready. You've taken the time to set yourself up for success. So now we're in the live event. And when it comes to engaging participants, let's think about our participant experience. The biggest benefit of virtual training, live online classroom, is that your attendees do not need to leave their desk, to leave their home, to attend a class. But that's also the biggest challenge, isn't it? They don't have to leave their desk in order to attend a class. So I'd love to know what's been your experience as participants in virtual classes. If you'd like to participate, we can build a word cloud. If you've got a device, if you have um, a web browser, you can go to menti.com and you would type in the code that's showing up on screen, 5361, 79, and 5. I'm seeing a few words pop into our questions box, things like distracted, things like boring, not engaging. Mm, I'll give a moment. Some of you are adding in some positive words. Many of you are adding in words that are not so positive. It does depend on the design. It depends on the facilitator. It depends on you, right? Paulina, I see a comment coming in our chat that we're going to come back and, and chat about a little bit later. I'll, I'll flag it so we can both see it. David is talking about the facilitator being interested in control, and, and, and we need to talk about that one. It's such a fascinating point. Thank you, David. We'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. Y'all, you are describing, thank you everyone, you are describing for most of us the participant experience that is unengaging, they're isolated, they're uncertain, they're distracted, the challenge of paying attention. Even today, Oh, I am, uh, I recognize, I know that it's tough to pay attention without drawing you in. And with the few hundred of you that are here, we're engaging you in certain ways. So thank you, everyone. I'm getting ready to take this word cloud off the screen. And just to note, those of you who were watching uh, this uh, recording playback, you may not be able to have contributed to the word cloud. So hopefully you see some of the words that you might recommend uh, or you, you would have said there. You know, we don't want our participants to be isolated or overwhelmed. We want to draw them in to help them feel connected and confident and engaged. And so how do you do that? How do we set the stage for our participants? We as presenters are getting drawn in. We want our uh, participants to be drawn in. And out on my resources page, I have a job that you can download. It's also in the handout, but it's about setting the stage for online engagement. We'll take a short look at them. The first one is to set 
the expectations in advance. And you may have some technology tools to do this in your learning management system to let people know in the description what type of live event you're going to have. And remember, we had our different types of events. Is it a meeting, a presentation, or a class. And when I'm leading a training event, I like to send an email to my participants in advance, letting them know right up front that this is going to be interactive, that this is going to be something where, say, we have our webcams on, or they need to come prepared to discuss a certain topic or have their uh, setup ready to go, that they need to test their system. If we're doing a guided learning journey, sending them a checklist of what they can expect and all of the things that are needed, or maybe we need to, if we're concerned they might not be technology savvy or have some issues, maybe I'm sending them a check checklist, a preparation checklist that's going to let them know here's how you set up your workspace, how you connect in, and what to do if you're having challenges. You see, I believe if you're going to have an interactive event that starts before it begins and then we want to capture their attention the moment they log in, how many of us might traditionally start a lesson, start a topic by having just a title slide on the screen. That does not work virtually. If the only thing you have on the screen when they connect in is a title slide that says, welcome to the session, we're not taking advantage of the opportunity to capture their attention. Instead, we're looking to start with a soft opening to draw them in, and that might be a checklist of things to do, a slide that includes action. It might include a discussion question. While we're waiting to begin, here's something we can talk about. It could include an activity for everyone to do. It depends on your content. It depends on your audience but we're trying to capture their attention the moment they log in. And then once they do that, once we have drawn in the attention, think about the opening few moments. What traditionally happens is the speaker begins their spiel. They start telling you, hello, my name is Cindy and welcome to the program. And then they go on for five minutes about the agenda, about the content, about the timing. And it's not that that's bad, but it gives the impression that the audience is not expected to interact. Instead, we're looking for an interactive opening. If we set the stage for interaction and we begin with interaction, then we want to start at the start time with interaction. That can simply show up as letting the attendees introduce themselves before the speaker does, or starting with a poll question that's going to get everybody to build in. You see, if we're bringing people together for the same time, it should be social. So I'll take today as an example. Those of you who are here with me live, we are making use of the tools to introduce ourselves and to connect. We're using our questions tool. We're using our raise hand tool. In a traditional classroom platform, we'd be in breakouts. We'd be drawing on the screen. We'd be doing a number of other things. We're drawing people together. And then we're keeping it going. Paulina, could we post our second poll question on the screen, please? How often should we be connecting? I'll give everyone a moment. And by the way, Cindy, thank you very much for this uh, tip about the intro slide. I think this is something that I really need to be using. So. <laughs> Guys, hopefully at the next webinars, you will see me doing that for sure. Paulina, you did it verbally asking everyone to uh, go ahead and start typing in questions. But yes, I love 
love that idea. So I think our responses have been coming in and I'd love to see how everybody has responded. Maybe one or two more moments for the rest of you to lock in your answer. And I can already tell you, we don't have agreement. We are not in agreement. We have uh, almost a, a perfect distribution among the four, six, eight, and 10. How often should we be inviting interaction about every four minutes? Y'all, it's fast. In person, we are looking for the interaction about every eight or nine minutes. We're online, it's about half of that. It's not, it's not a uh, ping the arm of the facilitator. Oh, four minutes have gone by, we should interact. No, it's woven into the session that we've created a dialogue and we're getting creative with the platform tools and we're frequently asking our participants, do the math in a 60 minute session, six zero divided by four, that's about 15 interactions. And our goal is to overcome the distractions of our learners to keep them involved in the session and engaged in the learning. And we get creative with the tools we have. So whether that's asking people to raise their hand, whether that's asking everyone to draw on the whiteboard, this is one of my favorite type of tools to use, opening up and asking everyone. We'll use the whiteboard for brainstorming, but we can also use it for introductions. I'll ask them to draw a picture of themselves or uh, to play bingo. And some of these are games, some of these are icebreakers, but I use them in the class to drive to the learning objectives. It shouldn't feel forced. It shouldn't feel like we're doing an activity just for the sake of the activity. Instead, we're doing this to drive to the learning objectives, to draw them in. Remember, our participants are completely distracted. We're working from home. We've got uh, the weight of the world on our shoulders. We've got things pulling at us. And if your content is so important that we need to draw them in, we want to keep them involved and engaged in their learning. So that takes us to step number five. This requires, this needs some enhanced delivery skills. And if I think about a analogy to use, our driving a vehicle might work best here. If you think about knowing how to drive a car, driving down the road, getting to your destination, and you ask somebody to drive a car to now drive a bus, could they do it? Well, they could, the basics are the same, but there's a few things that are now enhanced, a few extra things to keep in mind. Virtual facilitation is the same. Where we have, uh, classroom facilitation skills like driving a car and we're building on those we're adding on to them and those are things like engaging an audience that you don't see it's a skill that we can do it takes a little extra effort or multitasking paying attention to both the participants our learners as well as our technology remembering that they are adult learners. So the question that was asked earlier, David, it really wasn't a question, it was a comment in response to your experience. And uh, I, I love this question because a leader, a presenter who's more focused on themselves, more focused on controlling the environment is going to be less likely to enable our adult learners to turn control over to them, for them to discuss and dialogue and share and come to conclusions. You know, we think about the um, presenter role, I'm afraid of silence 
versus the facilitator role. I want my audience to come to their conclusions. And so enabling adult learners is a, a even more pronounced in the virtual classroom as an important skill for facilitators. Now, the other place that it's important, and Polina, I'm going to bring, I know we had a few uh, hiccups with my webcam earlier. I'm going to turn my webcam back on just for this part because um, when it comes to talking to a webcam or sharing the webcam, when we're in person, we don't have to speak to a, a lens or to a computer screen. But when we're online, using the webcam is a great way to engage. Now, in some platforms, we'll ask all the participants to turn on their webcam. But here in the virtual classroom, we're going to have the facilitator turn the camera on. So you tell me, what's the mistake? mistake that in this photo, and it's the most common mistake that gets made, she's looking down. She's looking down. A couple of you are asking me for uh, step number five, or excuse me, step number six. What is that? It is to uh, enhance your delivery skills. We're enhancing our delivery skills. And one way we're doing it is to make sure that when we're speaking to a camera, that the camera is at eye level. So this gentleman, and you'll see it as it comes up on your screen, and I'll demonstrate it if you're seeing my camera, is we don't want to look down at the camera, we want it to be at eye level. This gentleman uh, who is, photoed here, he's got the right idea, but he's way too close. <laughs> so we're looking for the correct distance. So why does it matter looking down when somebody sees you on the other side of the screen? You don't want to appear like you're dominating over them. You're looking to have equal footing. You're having a conversation. If you turn on the television and look at any news reporter, you're going to see them eye to eye looking in the camera. You're also looking to have their shoulders in the frame. See, the common mistake that people make, and I'll see if I can try to, try to demonstrate it, they sit so far back that there's lots of space or they sit so close in that we're watching their forehead or we're just seeing the top. So we're looking for the appropriate framing of our body. And I'm going to demonstrate something. And then, Paulina, if my webcam is causing too much trouble, we can turn it off again. Um, the Palm. And now that I adjusted to demonstrate that I'm a little bit off, when I place my palm on top of my head, my pinky finger should be right at the edge of the frame, the top edge of the camera. That's going to place our uh, selves, place our bodies the correct distance from the camera. You do not need a fancy setup. You don't need professional light. You don't need a uh, crazy background. What you need to have is eye contact, eye level. You want to be framed appropriately in the screen. And the last one is don't sit in front of a window with the window behind you because then we can't see your face. We want to have a setup where you're looking at the light. And most of us are working from home these days. You might have very limited options of where you can sit. You simply want to get a desk lamp or something that they are flashing, you are flashing, so that uh, you can see your face. You don't want to be shadowed out of it, and a desk lamp can help. I do like to let my participants know there's a question that's just come in from Edlin. Should we help them? And without any sort of, of shame or any sort of, you know, you know, get rid of the dirty laundry behind you in the background, but helping them adjust their angle, 
absolutely. I think that's a, a good thing to do. But we're starting to wind down. We have just two steps left. And Paulina, for those who joined in late, perhaps we can copy and paste that handout back into chat that has all seven of these steps spelled out. Step number six is to to pay attention to your voice. And as you pay attention to your voice, it goes hand in hand with your video. We are looking for a crystal clear connection. And for most of us, that means some type of headset. If you're trying to use just your computer, just your device, just your um, whatever you randomly have, the audio connection is going to be garbled. It's going to not be as clear. If you're trying to use that speakerphone, it will pick up the sound of every noise around you. So if you only make one investment, I would invest in a headset. And it can be something simple like the earbuds or it can be something fancier. That part doesn't uh, matter as much as just having a headset. And then listen listening to yourself as you are uh, going to present that you're not distracting your audience. And we can all try something wherever you happen to be, sit or if you're standing with your best posture. And then like you're at the doctor's office where you take a deep breath in and a deep breath out, just with good posture and a solid breath, your voice is going to sound like it has more energy. And we're looking for that energy to keep people engaged. We want to with our voice. So that takes us to our last step and then some great questions have come in. And as we look at step number seven, practicing practicing and practicing. However you need to prepare. And for some people that's putting on their favorite shirt. For others, it's organizing their desk, getting comfortable with the technology. For others, it's doing a dry run, going through and practicing with a partner, your method, your preparation. So I would like to know, I'd like to find out the uh, action step that you're going to take. And while you're telling me in the questions what you're going to do, I'd love to answer a few of the questions that have come in. And Evelyn has a question, how do you deal with the silence from participants after asking a question? Paulina, I know that one stood out to you as well. I would say that those four steps to engagement that I talked about how you set the stage, if you set the expectations, capture their attention from the moment they log in, you're seeking engagement and creating a dialogue, you won't have problems with silence. Try me on that one. Do those steps and notice the difference in the amount of engagement. The challenge or the, the mistake that many facilitators make is they wait until 15 minutes into an event before they ask the first question. We want to get them uh, interacting before that ever starts. Creating a social experience. I'm often with my classes, putting people into breakouts within the first five minutes. Go say hello to your team, come up with the team name and you'll be working in groups throughout the event. The second question that has come in that's really standing out to me, um, Paulina, is as we're looking at, many of you are asking about uh, backdrops and using the webcam. And my recommendation is to just not be distracting. If you've got um, a background that is going to be more detracting from the event, 
that, then not, then maybe think about getting a green screen. But um, as long as you don't have something inappropriate, and as long as your lighting is good and your eye contact is there, uh, then I think you're going to be just fine. Paulina, there were some questions about uh, tools to use a little bit earlier. I'm looking for those questions um, that you've flagged. And there's so many different tools out there on the, the market. And it's kind of like asking what's the best car to drive. There's not one best live virtual classroom platform out there. They all have uh, benefits. And you want to look at your organization. So if you know that you're going to do a lot of shared collaborating on whiteboards, you're going to look for a platform that has the shared collaboration features. If you know that you want that video capability to have eye-to-eye -eye contact with your attendees, you're going to look for a platform that allows for the robust video meetings. If you have attendees who are globally dispersed and bandwidth is a challenge, so you'll use telephone for connect instead of voice over IP, right? So you're looking at the requirements you need uh, for the live online classrooms. I'm glad that question came up because I wanted to mention that there's uh, not one, just one right answer. Craig has a question about, is it a best practice to have a moderator like Paulina and I have demonstrated? Yes, 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 and yes. I've been doing this for close to 20 years and I still use a moderator or a presenter a producer to help so that we are able to have one person managing the technology and somebody else who's able to facilitate or present. It's a good best practice, most definitely. Yo-Yo is asking how to encourage the audience to turn on their webcams. That goes back to setting expectations. What's the expectation for your event? What's the expectation? patient once they join. And for me, it's always an invitation. I won't ever force somebody to do it because I don't know what their situation is. Maybe bandwidth is preventing them from connecting. Maybe they're taking care of, now that we're working during the pandemic from home, a young child and they need to manage that in addition to. So, right, we don't know what their situation is, but it's always an invitation and that expectation set up front. I love, Edlin, your idea of having not just a moderator or a, a producer, but also having a co-facilitator so that you are able to have a conversation. You can have some banter to help keep uh, everyone connected. Well, thank you, everyone. I know we're almost out of time. For those of you that have been with us the entire event, I say thank you. If you're watching this back on a recording. Thanks to you as well. If I did not get to your question, I'm always happy to answer questions. You can find me on Twitter. I am Cindy Hug or on my website, cindyhuggett.com. You're welcome to reach out to me. I could talk about virtual training and the virtual classroom for hours. And Paulina, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks a lot, Cindy, sharing so many useful tips and I am sure that as soon as we get off of the session, we will leave it with a handful of knowledge about how to engage, uh, sorry, enhance our virtual meetings and the virtual events. Um, I am just happy that you agreed to become our guest uh, presenter today. So thank you very much for doing that. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you, our great attendees. Thank you very much, guys, for being so active, for participating in all the discussions, and for, for asking your great questions. We very much appreciate it. And at this time, we are ready to wrap up this wonderful session. I wish everyone a wonderful, wonderful day, and I hope to see you guys at the next session. Bye, everybody, and bye, Cindy.